Jeremiah chapter 1. And um, here we read about the call of Jeremiah. And if we read from verses 1 to 3, we read of the historical background. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. So in verse 1, we read that Jeremiah is the son of Hilkiah, and he was a priest. So Jeremiah was a son of a priest, so Jeremiah himself was a priest. And he's from a place called Anathoth, which, um, according to my footnotes, is about three miles north of Jerusalem. And this was a Levitical city in the, city, in the tribe, of, um, tribe allotment of Benjamin. And so Jeremiah wasn't a Benjamite, Benjaminite, he was a Levite. And um, in the land of Israel, the land was divided up into portions to the tribes, um, but the tribe of Levi were not allotted a tribe, um, a portion of land. And what the tribes had to do was allot certain cities, and they were called Levitical cities. And the Levites were the spiritual teachers of Israel in, in, the, in those days. And unlike today, where we have the privilege of having copies of the scriptures readily available, back then it wasn't so easy. And so the Levites had to maintain copies of the scriptures. So when the old copies wore out, they had to um, do new ones. And obviously not all the Levites could be in the temple because the temple was limited. And so the rest of the Levites across the land would teach the rest of the people in the ways of the Lord and teach them the scriptures. And then we come to verse 2. We read that he is called in the days of good king Josiah. And Josiah was the last good king of Judah. Um, each following, each king that followed Josiah was a wicked king, and which led to Jerusalem's destruction. Josiah tried to turn the nation around. He tried to reform the nation um, and take the nation back to the Lord. But because of the actions of a previous king, Manasseh, it meant that judgment was set and that destruction was to come. And so really the nation had passed beyond that point of no return. And I sometimes wonder if this nation, will we pass that point of no return where judgment is set? Um, but destruction was definitely certain. But because Josiah was a righteous king, because of his righteous kingship, it meant that judgment would not come in his day. And so he didn't see the judgment, but it would come in the future. And then in verse 3, we read he also, that Jeremiah also prophesied in the days of Jehoiakim, who was a wicked king, and Zedekiah, who was also an evil king, and he was basically just a puppet king of um, the Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon put him in. Um, but he would continue to prophesy beyond these kings, and he would um, prophesy in the days of Gedaliah, um, the governor that Nebuchadnezzar put in after the fall of Judah. And he would also continue to prophesy even in Egypt when the people went, even though Jeremiah advised them, do not go to Egypt, they went against him and they ended up going to Egypt. But Jeremiah continued to prophesy even then. And so that's just the historical background to the book. But then we come to the actual call of Jeremiah in verses 4 to 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. 
See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And so the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah in verse 4. And in verse 5, we read this very interesting verse that God knew Jeremiah before his very conception. Now, the Lord is omniscient, obviously. He knows everything past, present, and future. But the word here, there's two Hebrew words for know. And one means to know by head knowledge, and the other means to know by experience. And it's that latter Hebrew word that's used here. It means here that God knew Jeremiah by experience. And even before he was conceived, he had made this commitment to Jeremiah of all these promises that we read in this chapter. And this has major implications for the whole issue of abortion, doesn't it? Um, what would have happened if Jeremiah, Jeremiah's mother had decided to abort him? What would that have done to God's purposes? Now, obviously, nothing can thwart God's purpose, but you know what I'm trying to say in terms of the implications. These are massive implications with regard to this issue. Um, and then we go on to read the second statement. And before you were born, I consecrated you. So even before he was born, he was, Jeremiah was sanctified. He was set apart to be a prophet. And I believe this definitely shows that abortion is murder. And just a few other scriptures that speak about this issue. If we just turn to Job chapter 10. Job 10, verses 8 to 12. Your hands fashioned and made me altogether, and would you destroy me? Remember now that you have made me as clay, and would you turn me into dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese, clothe me with skin and flesh, and knit me together with bones and sinews? You have granted me life and loving kindness, and your care has preserved my spirit. And here we see that God controls the development of the baby in the womb. And if we just go over to Psalm, some well-known verses in Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. For you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you, when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet... There was not one of them. And even before the psalmist David was born, the Lord had a plan for him. God clearly viewed him as a person. And actually, just another scripture as well is in Psalm 51. Just go back. Psalm 51, verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. And I don't think this is saying that the acts of giving birth or conceiving are in themselves sinful, but at the point of conception, he had the sin nature. David had the sin nature, and only people have a sin nature. Animals don't have a sin nature. Now, I have a cat, and he's very naughty sometimes. He scratches the carpet. You can shout at him as hard as you can, and he just looks at you as if, what are you going on about? Because he doesn't know right from wrong. He doesn't have a sin nature. But people do have a sin nature, and they do know right from wrong. They do have a conscience. And David had that from conception. And just one more scripture over in the New Testament, in um, Romans chapter 9. Romans 9, verses 10 and 11. 
And not only this, but there was Rebecca also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who called. And here again we see that the Lord had chosen Jacob even before the twins were born. The twins were not yet born in verse 11, yet the Lord had made his choice with regards to the twins of Jacob and Esau. And so all these scriptures clearly point to the fact of this issue of abortion. So if we just go back to um, Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. So the Lord had set Jeremiah apart to be a prophet. And then we also read the third statement. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. And the word here, the Hebrew word here is goim, which means Gentiles. And so he's also a prophet to the Gentiles. And Jeremiah speaks much regarding the nation of Judah, the Jewish people, in chapters 2 to 45. But he doesn't deal with the Gentiles in chapters 46 to 51. And the word appointed there, it actually means appoint, appointed to a specific assignment. And in Isaiah 49 verse 6, the Messiah, our Lord Jesus, was appointed to restore Israel and to be a light to the Gentiles. Jeremiah was appointed to be a prophet. And in Galatians 1, Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, Paul was appointed to be an apostle. But when God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. There are very similar appointments between Paul and Jeremiah. Paul was appointed to be an apostle, specifically an apostle to the Gentiles. And then if we just go back to Jeremiah chapter 1 again. And if we read verse 6, there's an objection. Jeremiah objects to this call. And so he says, alas, Lord God. And this is basically an exclamation of lament. And he's basically saying, I do not want to do this. I don't want to be a prophet. He didn't want to do this. And the reason that he gives is that he doesn't know how to speak. I am a youth. And... It can mean child, this word. This word can mean a child. But really what he's saying is that he's a child in experience. At the time, Jeremiah would prob- most probably be in his early 20s, the latest 30. But what he's saying is that he's inexperienced in public speaking. And I think when we're all starting out speaking at the, at the pulpit, we can, also, or we can all say that we're inexperienced. But the Lord can help us. And... Um, This is reminiscent of what Moses said in Exodus, um, chapter 4. Moses was quite a lot older, I think he was about 80 when he was called. But Moses, in Exodus 4, verses 10 to 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in times past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. The fact of the matter is, is that the Lord can use young people. And Paul encourages Timothy, don't have to turn to this, in um, 1 Timothy 4 verse 12. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. And so Paul encourages Timothy to be, as a young person, because he will have been a young person then, to be an example to other believers. And then we go on to read in verses 7 to 8 of the Lord's answer, God's answer to this. And basically it says in, the Lord says in verse 7, Jeremiah, don't say that. Don't say you can't do this. 
what he is to do is to go wherever God sends him. Experience is not necessary because all he has to do is speak the words of the Lord. And then in verse 8, it says he isn't to be afraid of them. This is his security. His security is promised to him. He's not to be afraid because the Lord is with him. And he will experience attacks, but his life will be spared, for I am with you to deliver you. And not, this promise was not made to every prophet. There are all the prophets that did die a martyr's death, but Jeremiah in this case is promised that he will not die a martyr's death. And then in verse 9, the Lord touches Jeremiah's mouth. And this signifies the words that Jeremiah is speaking of, the words of the Lord. And just going back to those first couple of verses that we read, the words of Jeremiah and the word of the Lord. You know, what we are reading this morning are the words of a man, but it's also the word of the Lord. It's inerrant, divinely inspired scripture. And the Lord uses, by his Holy Spirit, used Jeremiah to write down these things inerrantly. And so the Lord touches his mouth and it signifies that the Lord is putting his words into his mouth. And this is also similar to the call of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. Because the Lord also touches Isaiah's mouth in Isaiah 6 verses 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongues. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. Now, the purpose is different because the Lord touches the lips of Isaiah to cleanse him of his sin and of, iniqu of his iniquity. Whereas Jeremiah is touched to put the words of the Lord into his mouth. But... The reaction of Isaiah is different because in verse 8 um, we read, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Isaiah wanted to do, be a prophet. He wanted to do this task. Yet Jeremiah's reaction was quite the opposite, quite different. But the context is the same in which the Lord touches these prophets' mouths, which is in the context of appointing these people to be a prophet. And then in verse 10, we read about his prophetic authority, that he is appointed this day over the nations and over the kingdoms. Again, he is appointed over these Gentile nations. And this is an authority, not a political authority or a religious authority. It's a spiritual prophetic authority that he has to proclaim the word of the Lord regarding these nations. And he prophesies destruction and restoration and it's quite interesting that he there's four phrases used with regards to destruction which is to pluck up to break down to destroy and to overthrow but then there's two phrases just used for restoration to build and to plant and this really sets the tone for the book of jeremiah because he will emphasize destruction but there will be hope of restoration there but he majors on um, destruction but minors upon restoration but there is hope for the future and you do see that in the book and actually just a few examples um, in chapters 46 to 51 Jeremiah prophesies destruction against the nations of Edom and Babylon and there's no hope for them in the future the Lord will completely destroy them but some other nations like Moab and Ammon there is hope for the future because you read all this judgment and then, then at the end it says, yet I will restore the fortunes of Ammon or whoever. And so that's just a few examples where we see that the Lord does promise restoration. And then in verses 11 to 16, there's the confirmation of Jeremiah's call. He's, he receives two visions with regards um, to, verse, to, to confirm verses 4 to 10. So read in verse 11. The word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. The word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot 
facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, Out of the north the evil will break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they will come and they will set each one his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem and against all its walls round about and against all the cities of Judah. I will pronounce my judgment on them concerning all their wickedness, whereby they have forsaken me and have offered sacrifices to other gods and worshipped the works of their own hands. So in verses 11 and 12, we read about the first vision that Jeremiah receives that confirms his call to be a prophet. But in in English, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, because what's an almond tree got to do with what do you know over God's word? In English, that just makes no sense whatsoever. And so it is lost in translation, this um, vision. But in Hebrew, there is a link between the words almond in verse 11 and the word watching in verse 12. And it's really what you would call a word play. It's a Hebrew word play. And in verse 11, the word almond and in verse 12, the word watching, they, same, they share the same Hebrew root. And the first word almond is shaked. And the word for watching is shocked. So it's only one difference in vowel. So it's coming from the same root word. And the root word for almond means to be aware, to be watchful, to be alert. And the almond plant in the land of Israel was the first plant to spring up after winter. It was the first um, plant to spring in the spring to come up in the spring and it would bud um, early in the spring and it's like a watchman announcing the coming of spring and so this is the link to verse 12 because the application is given in verse 12 that the Lord says you've seen well for I am watching over my word to perform it and so the point is is that God will make sure that Jeremiah's prophecies will be fulfilled this is God's word. And indeed, near prophecies, his near prophecies were fulfilled. And so we know because his near prophecies were fulfilled that we can trust his far prophecies regarding the return from the captivity, but even beyond, beyond our own time, regarding the restoration of Israel, the, the people, the nation, the Jewish people coming back to the land. These are all things that we know we can trust because God is watching over his word. And because he's watching over his word, he's going to make sure that everything that is written in his book will come to pass because God fulfills his word. And in verses 13 to 16, we read about this second vision, this vision of this boiling pot. And this is um, something that you'd use for cooking or washing, but usually cooks um, food in it but we read in verse 13 that it's facing away from the north so it's coming from the north and it's tipping south so the contents is flowing from north to south and really whatever it touches it burns and in verse 14 there is the application which is that the Lord is going to send judgment from the north and though it's not named yet, the, nation, the actual specific nation is not named in verse 14, we do know, as we read on, that that nation is Babylon, that the Lord uses to deal with Judah. And in verse 15, we read that Jerusalem will fall. And it's seen in the fact that even the, the invading leaders will be able to sit at the gates of Jerusalem put their throne there so this shows that the city has fallen and not only Jerusalem but the rest of the cities in Judah will have fallen because they will be able to sit, set up um, their thrones in these places and then in verse 16 we read about the cause of this judgment and it's threefold it's, it's concerning their wickedness and it's because they've forsaken the Lord they have offered sacrifices to other gods and thirdly, they have worshipped the works of their own hands, idols. And I can apply that to our nation today. We have gone away from the Lord. We've imported idols. And the Lord pronounces judgment. And we are deserving of judgment for how we have departed from the Lord's ways, haven't we? And so 
Judah was guilty of gross idolatry. And so judgment is going to come. But then in verses 17 to 19, the Lord gives a command to Jeremiah. Now gird up your loins and arise and speak to them all which I command you. Do not be dismayed before them, or I will dismay you before them. Now behold, I have made you today as a fortified city, and as a pillar of iron, and as walls of bronze against the whole land, to the kings of Judah, to its princes, to its priests, and to the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. And so the command in verse 17 to Jeremiah is basically go and be a prophet do your work as a prophet gird, your lo- gird up your loins that's an expression that means be ready be ready for, for the task at hand and he is to speak all of the Lord's words he is not to be afraid if he obeys then he will be victorious over his enemies and he will see his prophecies fulfilled and his enemies will see his prophecies fulfilled And then in verse 18, sorry, at the end of verse 17, we read, though, the consequences of disobedience. If the Lord, if he obeys, if Jeremiah obeys the Lord, then he will not be dismayed. But if he disobeys, then there are consequences for that. I will dismay you before them. And then in verse 18, we read that Jeremiah is to be like this impregnable, um, indefensible city, heavily fortified city. So that he will be able to defend himself against the kings of Judah. And indeed, all of the kings of Judah, except Josiah, attacked him. They couldn't, they didn't want anything to do with him. And there's one example of King Jehoiakim. And he, um, the scroll which had the prophecies of Jeremiah was read to him. And Jehoiakim just cut the scroll up and chucked it in the fire. And then we read to its princes, these are the government officials, and indeed they persecuted Jeremiah, and especially at the end of Zedekiah's reign. And then we read of his fellow priests, his own priests, the Levites, his priests attacked him, and the general population. So that's a lot of people that you've got against you, haven't you? I mean, you've got the kings, the, the government officials, the priests and the people. He's in a minority. He only had a few allies. Um, but he had a lot of enemies. But he was not to be afraid, because in verse 19, the Lord promises his deliverance. And as I said before, that does not mean that he would be exempt from attacks. He was attacked. He experienced much physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, he was attacked. Yet the Lord would not, would not let him die. He would spare his life. Because the Lord is with him. And in conclusion, you know, what can we take from this as believers in the Lord? Well, what we can say is that Jeremiah, he fulfilled his call despite all the adversity. And there were times where he complained and he was like, basically, saying, I've had enough. But he kept to it and he was faithful to his call. And how we need to be faithful to our call as believers in the Lord to remain faithful. Sometimes we can get down, we can get depressed. But how we need to stay on that straight and narrow path. What else can we say? We can we can say that he was in the minority. And sometimes I feel very much in this nation like we're in the minority for standing for the things of the Lord. We have a lot of people against us in the government, in our local councils. We see laws that are passed that are not nothing to do with what the scriptures say, that are completely opposed to what the scriptures say. Yet we have to keep on going and we have to keep on standing upon God's word. And though we might be in the minority, we have to remember that the Lord is with us as well as he was with Jeremiah. And we're all, as believers, we all have a role to play in the body of Christ. Jeremiah was called to be a prophet. He had a role. But all of us as believers have a role to play in the body. We each have a function to play. And... What we have to say also is that he was not exempt from persecution. And we as believers aren't exempt 
from persecution. I'm not saying that we're all going to get chucked into prison, but it wouldn't surprise me. Um, some people aren't persecuted. Some believers have gone through life fairly well, but we are to expect it. We are to expect tribulation. Jesus said, expect tribulation. The Lord, Paul said, all who are godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And so we are ex at least to expect persecution and opposition. Um, and I think sometimes when we live in the West, we can feel a bit um, sheltered from certain rights that we have. But when we think of believers elsewhere in the world, in the Middle East, in China, in North Korea, they're suffering heavily for their faith in the Lord Jesus. And who knows, in the future, we may have to face certain trials. But as we read there, the Lord will always give us the grace to get through these trials. Um, and because we know he's with us, we, he will be with us till the end. And even if it did mean death. I don't, I don't mean to say that we're all going to die, but the Lord will be with us all, all the way. And just something to say also, that Jerem, I don't want this all to be doom and gloom, that Jeremiah did prophesy a better future. There were chinks of light, and this, it's a book, it's a heavy book to read, and it's pretty depressing. But in chapters 30 to 33, he speaks much about the um, restoration of Israel, and the, which is yet future, the millennium. Um, and he speaks about the new covenant, and which was made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And we are partaking today as believers in the Lord Jesus, because we are partaking in that new covenant. It is made with the Jewish people, but we as Gentiles have been grafted in, and are partaking of those spiritual blessings through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the basis for the new covenant is the shed blood of Christ. That's what we learn in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. And we, when, as believers, we are to live a life that is consecrated to him, because we now belong to him, we are to live a life that is set apart wholly to the Lord. Jeremiah was sanctified. He was set apart to be a prophet. And we, as believers, should also be set apart to live a life holy to the Lord. So I just thought in closing we could sing a song, Take My Life and Let It Be, um, Consecrate His Holy Lord to Thee. Um, and just consider, let's just consider the words um, this morning. Thank you. Yes, Lord, we do long to live a consecrated holy life, Lord, that's set apart to you. Lord, we just say thank you for the example of Jeremiah. Lord, may we be faithful to our call that we have as believers in the Lord Jesus. And we just say thank you, Lord, for the blessings of the new covenant, Lord, that we can have fellowship with God, that we can experience forgiveness of sins. And we just say thank you that the basis of that new covenant is the shed blood of Jesus at Calvary. And so, Lord, we just pray, Lord, that we would continue to live a holy life set apart to you. Sometimes we do fail, Lord. We have that sin nature in us. But, Lord, we just say thank you for that process of sanctification, Lord, that we are being conformed to the image of the Son day by day. And, Lord, we have that hope that one day we will see you face to face, Lord, in that new resurrected body. And so we just give you our thanks. Amen. Amen.